uh, walking down from my home, I met um, a colleague of mine who was looking a little bit the worst for wear, to be honest. Uh, but when I said I was coming here and talking here, he said, I know, they're doing this. This is fantastic. At least the, the undergraduates are setting the intellectual agenda for this institution. And he was uh, absolutely delighted with this. So I think you're doing a lot more for people who you may not know that you're touching with, with what you're doing here. And I'm personally very delighted to be here. I should explain my title briefly. This is not about the pain of giving birth. I took uh, morphine legally and it was fine. Uh, so I have uh, nothing to say about that. It's two separate issues um, that uh, I was uh, thinking about. Um, and I was thinking in particular about two experiences, one international, <coughs> one domestic, um, that made me think about these two topics and they are separate in my head, but I think as we talk through them, perhaps some connections uh, might arise. So I'm just very briefly for about 10-15 minutes going to say uh, something, uh, not very academic, more from sort of lived experience, because you have a lot of good academic papers coming up later. One from classics, I'm very proud to see. Um, so um, you will get that anyway, and I thought I'd start with, with just a few thoughts from my own experience. Um, the last time a group of undergraduates asked me to talk about feminism was in Egypt, uh, when I went there straight after the uh, revolution of the 25th of um, January 2011 <coughs> to speak, also a keynote address, on drama and democracy, the link between performance, uh, public performance, uh, uh, performance for the people, and the uh, democratic system of government, which of course are connected historically in 5th century Athens, but also have a long history, and long and interesting history, which suddenly came to the fore for colleagues in Cairo University after the revolution, colleagues who had been working on either democracy or drama uh, for many years and under very, very difficult circumstances of censorship, and all of a sudden uh, thought, this is what we need to investigate now, and it was brilliant. But it has to be said that the undergraduates, many undergraduates who were there, were asking me, how do you manage to be a mother and an academic? Uh, where are your children? Who's looking after your children? Um, why didn't you bring them here? We are quite good babysitters, you know. They could have stayed, we could have looked after them, which I'm sure would have been the case. I didn't tell them that actually my father had been super worried about me going to Egypt straight after the revolution. And I said, you're a mother, you shouldn't take any risk, you shouldn't go there. In fact, there wasn't, as it happened, very much risk. But it's also true there were very, very few people traveling to Egypt at that time because the situation looked very uncertain. Um, but actually, my experiences there had more to do with the first of my two topics, physical courage. And I'll tell you just three brief anecdotes um, about my stay in Egypt and what they made me think about. So first I started talking to a young male colleague from Upper Egypt, a small university, and I asked him about the revolution. I said, did you go to Tahir Square? Did you go on the 25th of January? And he said to me, do you know, Barbara, I went, but I went not because I'm brave, but because I, I actually I was afraid. And I was so afraid that I would be picked up in my own flat in front of my wife and my three-year-old son that actually I felt safer in the streets together with lots and lots of other people going. And he told me, in fact, that he had lied to his wife, said he was going to the apartment, and actually then, by one way or another, managed to get a train and then walk and then hitch a lift and, and get himself to Tahir Square, which is very far from where he lives. And that once he was in Tahir Square and he saw... Um, Christians praying when Muslims made a ring around them to protect them. Then he rang his wife and he said, I'm here, and this is amazing. Um, and his wife didn't want to go, but he didn't want to stay because he had put on uh, a performance of the Antigone, which is a pretty subversive play. And he said, because it said Creon, it didn't say Mubarak, uh, uh, the censorship let it go through. But then after the revolution or during the revolution, he knew that this might be rethought, and especially as there had been a few reviews of this student play he'd put up, which said, well, this is pretty subversive. So he was afraid. And that's why he joined uh, the Tahir Square um, revolution. Then I asked the students, a group pretty much like you, that this kind of size, and we were sort of together at, um, at a kind of bar and after the conference, and I asked them, well, 
did you go to Dahir Square on the 25th of January? And the guys said yes, and every single girl, woman, <coughs> sorry, uh, said no. And, um, and so I said, oh, that's interesting. So uh, the men went, but the women didn't go. Are you also revolutionaries? I said to the women. Um, and they said, um, well, yes, yes, we think this was good. This was important. We need to have more say. Everybody in Egypt, including women, need to have more say. But, you know, we were afraid. And people got beaten up very badly. People got raped. And then one of the male students said to me, do you know, I actually did see a young woman who was marching in front of me, and I was afraid, and I saw her, and I thought, well, actually, I shouldn't be afraid. I should march ahead of her, and so I started kind of going ahead and feeling I should, you know, be brave and try and protect her, or at, at any rate, not look cowardly. You know, that, that was what he said. Then I talked to a colleague, a, a, a woman who had given an excellent feminist uh, paper on a on an American play and had fielded some quite searching questions from quite, you know, entitled male um, American academics and she had, you know, done a very good job of that earlier. And I said to her, well, did you go? And she said, yes, I went to Tahir Square. We did it that way. I've got two teenage daughters. My husband went. He looked up. We stayed at the flat quite near the square. And he looked around and when it looked like it was fairly calm, it didn't look like there would be incidents. He would ring us on our mobile phone, and I, my daughters and I came, and we also ma manifested on the square. And I, it was important to me that my daughters should take part in this. This is the most important event that has happened in Egypt, probably the most important that they will ever witness. And it was important to me that they would have the say, because in the end, who was at the square will determine what happens to this country, and we need women, and we need secular women, and we need all sorts of people to be there, Christians praying, Muslims praying, to make the new Egypt. Now that sounded sensible to me, very likely what I would have done myself. But what I really thought about um, also crystallized in the third experience, which was when I decided to go and see the pyramids. And the pyramids were more or less closed. There were no tourists. No one was coming to Egypt. They were just sort of, well, they stand there. I mean, they were there. They were accessible. <laughs> um, uh, time is afraid of the pyramids, uh, a, a proverb says. You know, we're afraid of time, but time is afraid of the pyramids. So the pyramids were fine. But, you know, there was no one willing to take you there. There were no sort of, I, I didn't know how to do it. So a student said to me, don't worry, I'll take you there. That's fine. We'll just take a cab. Uh, it's not far. We'll go. So I went with him and a few other people, and it was amazing because there were a few local tourists, but it was empty. There were still a few people hanging around with trinkets and camels, hoping that some tourists might show up, but they were bored, and so um, the lads that were looking after the camels decided to race the camels around the pyramids, which was an amazing scene. And I felt, you know, I had one of those moments where I thought, maybe Herodotus, when if he came here, he saw this kind of thing, and it was pretty amazing to see, because camels are fast, actually, it turns out, and they looked frightening uh, in some way. So anyway, this was exhilarating. We watched, we chatted, and then the student um, said to me, you know, uh, um, I don't really like riding camels all that much, but what you can do here is, uh, you see down there, there's that little farm in the sand. I mean, it looked like a hut completely covered in sand because the desert starts right outside Cairo at the pyramids of Giza. And he said, uh, you can rent horses there. And what I often do with my friend, we ride across the desert to the next oasis. You see those other pyramids at, you know, at the far end over there. We, we ride our horses over there. And then there, there's a pretty good place that does um, roast chicken. So we eat our chicken, and then sometimes we spend the night there, and then we ride back the next day. It's a great day out. I thought, well, this is a great night, day out. And I said, because we'd been talking about his girlfriend, I said, how about your girlfriend? Does she come too? They said, ah, oh, you know, I mean, no, actually, she doesn't come, because then I would have to worry. What if the horse falls? What if she falls? It's, you know, it's a thing for lads, basically, is what he said to me. She could come, but then I would worry all the time. Is she okay? Is she not okay? So, you know, I thought about all these things, and they seemed sensible to me. I thought, well, I wouldn't want to fall off a horse in the middle of the desert either. I wouldn't want to be beaten up or raped in Tahir Square. I certainly wouldn't want my daughter to feel to experience that in her teens. Uh, 
it all makes sense. I even understood my father saying, you know, what are you going to Egypt? And he did unsettle me a bit, although I didn't actually risk anything. And it made me think how indebted I am to the, the ex extremists of the movement, yeah? To the tomboys, to the, to the women who got um, themselves chained to railings, to the people who have, the women particularly, who have physical courage. And the fact is that when I was in Egypt, I thought, we need a few of those. You know, we need a few tomboys who will actually do the horse riding, who will show it. You know, we need the girl, the woman who, um, who um, inspired courage in the others while she was marching to Tahrir Square. But it is something uh, that I personally am not very good at. As I said, I got my morphine and, you know, I'd rather not have a, a, any of that. So it's about linking up to people who are different and recognizing what people put of themselves, and also recognizing how indebted we are uh, to people who may be more extreme than we are um, in, in their courage. So that's kind of part one of this talk, such as it is. Part two is much closer to home. So then we, I'm thinking, well, you know, compared to the kind of choices and questions that I was putting to students and colleagues in Egypt, and what I was expecting of them, did you go, did you not go, you know, were you brave enough, were you not brave enough, well, I'm not particularly brave at all. Um, and then I was thinking, well, what about life here in this institution? And as some of you know, I had a moment of uh, disillusionment last year when three things got together and I thought, well, actually, you know, there are issues uh, for women at these institutions and for all of us, in fact, in terms of equality of treatment and opportunity. And I wrote about them in the Times Higher, which is probably why you asked me uh, to talk here um, in the first instance. And I'll say a few things about that without repeating uh, too much of what I've, I've written there, because I know that some of you have written it. But I think it's important <coughs> to think also about what happens here and what happens in higher education everywhere. Because, um, you know, higher education is about young people and it's about, it's based on ideas. And so there, it can become a place of utopian experiment, you know, and um, educational utopias are important because sometimes they actually set the agenda for real uh, educational um, um, experiments. So your motto, teach to transgress, <coughs> is very much at risk at the moment, because actually we are teaching, you know, we are asked to measure a teaching for employability, for example, not for, for transgression. I mean, who wants to em employ a transgressive so-and-so, right? I mean, that's not what employers are necessarily looking for. Um, there are all sorts of issues to do with what education is for that need to be thought through, um, and which have to do with the fact that education could be a truly a utopian experiment, and there has been a lot uh, written on that kind of vein, and I was looking whether there were any papers on that, but, you know, utopian writing is an important mode, and it has a lot to do with education, in fact, everything to do with education uh, from the beginning, so that's an area that one could explore. But uh, I, am, I was actually um, made aware last year that we are in danger of becoming dystopic in many ways and some of the challenge is to face up to those ways to look at them straight in the eye to think about what we can change without losing our good vibes as it were without kind of losing a sense of what it is that is going well and what i realized last year was first of all we were told in no uncertain terms that uh, women professors in durham earn a lot less than male professors and the differential is so big that actually the EU law, which is so uh, despised in this country, was getting involved in saying you have to do something about it. So what Durham did about it, to start with at least, was that they gathered us, female professors, and said, uh, oh, you know, you don't earn as much as men, so we'll offer you a course to become better. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that, that didn't go down very well with me. You know, I got a, a little bit annoyed about that. And I said, how about offering a course to some unnamed, well, I did name a few <laughs> male colleagues, you know, about bullying, bullish behavior and so on, you know, how about, um, how about that for a course, you know? Um, but actually, I'm not unhappy with my salary. I think it's okay. So, you know, it didn't really uh, upset me all that much. 
The other review was about governance, and then at that point in time, there was only one female head of department in the whole university, in fact, your wife, um, and um, no uh, provost chancellors at all, uh, of which there are several, and there are ever more, but, uh, but of these <laughs> figures, there was not a single woman. So that was pretty clear as well, that there was something wrong. But then on the other hand, you know, I, I had more than once been told, oh, why don't you uh, go for, you know, leadership positions, this and that and the other. And they have something attractive about them, but there are also lots of drawbacks, as I see from my own poor beleaguered husband who is head of department. I mean, these are not particularly enjoyable jobs. So fair enough, maybe women don't want to do them. I thought that's fine. But what really got me was when I realized that in terms of research, for the research assessment exercise, uh, there's a decision about who will be submitted to that exercise, and very, very few women. Um, I mean, there are already fewer female researchers in Durham than researchers overall, but even of that proportion, a smaller, much smaller proportion was submitted to this exercise, which effectively means that in Durham, people made a decision that research by women was, on average, less good than research by men. Now, actually, I'm naive enough that this really surprised me. I thought, how can this be? You know, okay, we don't, want, we don't have as much power, we don't have as much money, fair enough, I can understand that. Well, we're not as good at research. That really surprised me. I thought, well, we've got pretty good brains. In fact, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I really just didn't, <laughs> didn't think that was an issue, right? So that, that really worried me. And I thought, well, how? How can this be? Is it because the exercise is set up in such a way that women are discriminated? That's one possibility, right? The other possibility is that women are less good at research. Right? It's either or. It's one of these two. In fact, I think it's probably a mixture of both. Yeah, um, and that's why it's messy. You know, The results uh, by women are what they are. Uh, and also, there are some ways in which I think the exercise is cute. So, what I think is, first of all, the exercise focuses on very few pieces of significant research. Right? Very, very few. You, you don't submit everything you've done. You just choose a few that are really important pieces. So in order to produce them, you have to learn to say no, right? Not do a million different pieces, companion pieces, this, that, and the other thing that people might ask you to do. You've got to say, no, actually, I'm doing this, and therefore I'm not doing that. Only yesterday, I'm going to a conference in Oxford, quite a high-powered thing in two weeks' time, and there's a famous professor who wrote to all of us. He was also supposed to submit a paper of this and show up like me. And he wrote and he said, um, unfortunately, I've decided I'm not coming and I'm not submitting the paper because, uh, and this will have to be sacrificed to the altar of the book I'm writing. So all of us were asked to sacrifice to the altar of the book he's writing, and so he's not going to come. Now, I would never do something like that. Yeah? But of course, this is good behavior in terms of making sure you've got one big thing that is really important, really significant, and that down the line will count. Right? But it's uncomfortable. One can do it different ways from him, but still learning to say no, I think is important. Second thing, blow your own trumpet, right? So you have to say at the beginning of your piece, this is a really important piece. It's really kind of game changing, at least two or three paradigm shifts in here. You know, it, <laughs> I mean, you have to be realistic, but at the same time, you can't start by saying, oh, I'm building on the work of so-and-so, 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 and I'm adding a little footnote when actually this is more than a footnote. So it's also about rhetoric and how you present yourself. And I'm not saying that this is a, a man-woman divide, but I do think that the rhetoric has an impact on how you then get assessed. And related to this, citation patterns are important. So um, a friend of mine who is actually assessing all this work for philosophy said to me, I'm really staggered because no one is quoting me. You know, It's my idea, and they say, here's a great idea by me, and it's actually mine, and I published 15 years earlier. How is this? happening. And again, it's about visibility, it's about whether you said this is a big idea, you know, you've got to quote it, and how we present ourselves in that way. These are subtle things. They're not, you know, do I now get beaten up in Tahir Square or not? But they're still significant, uh, I think, in various ways. And then there's the issue of institutional mobility. One way to, to make sure that your ideas are appreciated has to do with being, going places, uh, talking at different places, even changing institution in terms of work. Uh, in the science, you can't actually submit pieces to this assessment exercise 
if uh, the first author on your paper is from the same institution as you are. So again, this is a, more of a problem for women because especially women with children are less mobile. You know, you have to uproot a whole family, you have to uproot a, a husband who may also be working somewhere. So um, statistically, you can just show that it is much, much harder for women to move, which again also has to do with salaries because moving usually uh, improves your chances of a good salary, which has to do with things, uh, with, with um, power as well, because you move to a better place, then you, you know, to a better position, then you have had that experience and you can move again. So mobility has a lot to do with academic careers and it doesn't favor women. In fact, one last anecdote about this, um, you know, I was headhunted for a university and said, oh, you know, we've got this chair, we really want, you know, are you interested, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, yeah, I would be if I was on my own, but I would have to approve everybody, you know, my kids, my husband, you know, on the whole, no. So they said, oh, all right, so can you help us appoint to this position? I said, okay, fine, three days I can go there and help them appoint, right? So then someone else applied, a colleague of mine, who, you know, from Heidelberg, who I knew didn't want to vote, but, you know, he went through the whole thing. He sent an application, he did a thing, then we interviewed him. He didn't, you know, he was on holiday, so he wanted the interview date to change. You know, you could tell that this guy was not exactly entirely committed, but they were flattered, he was flattered. And, in the end, the position was offered to him. He got a massive, you know, a good salary rise where he was. He didn't come. End result was more money for him, no position for this institution, more work for me. And what was that all about? Mobility at the end of the day, and whether you could convince people that you would move, right? Or whether, you know, okay, I don't like this kind of game anyway, but it is that kind of thing that has an impact on all three of the issues, power, money, and how your research is evaluated at the end of the day. So, you're not very mobile because of children, right? You may have problems focusing single-mindedly on a few significant things rather than spreading yourself and saying yes to this, that, and the other and doing a miscellaneous thing. Again, I have to say, in my experience, motherhood is all about being miscellaneous. Right? It's not, I focus on this one and only thing. Unless you focus one and only on your kids, which is, you know, problematic for all sorts of ways, and certainly is no career. But if you want a career and children, then you're miscellaneous. I mean, you're going to kind of juggle it and do it this way or the other. And actually, academia values focus and concentration on a few important and significant things. So I see some kind of tension there. And um, blowing your, trump your trumpet rhetorically, oh, this is the great and amazing thing, here I am, you know, doing that kind of job. Well, again, I don't think that's very, very much the same as motherhood. Motherhood is a lot about also appreciating, and pa parenthood more generally, appreciating other people, saying, oh, you've done really well, you know, and nurturing and doing that sort of thing. So again, it's not a natural kind of combination of skills that you have there. So what do we do? Well, you know, we want to participate in a lot of different games, and at the same time, we want to change the rules of the games. We want to go to the here square and also feel safe, right? But you have to first change things before you can feel safe. You know, you want to have an academic career, and at the same time, I personally would like to change a lot of rules about how the game is played. A lot of what I said, I would do away with, straight away. You know, I don't think that mobility should have anything to do with anything, for example, right? But um, but how do you do it? How do you change the rules and at the same time play the game? You can't really. And I think there's a lot of improvising involved, a lot of improvising and a lot of cooperation involved. So, you know, when I applied for a grant, I said I'd had two kids and really, you know, under special circumstances and I think really I should have a bit of time for research for that. I saw the reports and they came back and they said, uh, yes, she's right, you know, if equal opportunity means anything, she should have the grant, also for that reason. A male colleague of mine, I said to him, oh, you've had three kids, you've looked after your kids, you know, say the same thing, look, here is the paragraph, I put it in that box, you know, go send it. He did it, and you know what the report said when it came back, it's none of our business if so-and-so decides to have however many kids. Yeah, completely different response. I, if he's so stupid that he hasn't got a wife that looks after his kids, then, you know, is that our problem? That, that was the answer, right? Whereas with me, it was, oh, she's great, she's managed to do so far, you know. So we need to be very aware 
of, the, of these things that are happening. Talk across, try and, and figure out what the connections are. And in my view, make sure that they're visible, that we talk about them, that we talk across lines, that we go to Egypt, that we talk to people there, that we talk to ourselves here. And the last thing I would say from my own personal experience is that we have a very high negotiating chip, which is our own happiness. You know, people who care about, about us will also care that we're happy. And I think we can demand a lot. I do that with my husband. You need to do this, 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 this. But then in the end, I'm happy, right? That's important, and that does a lot, because a happy woman makes everybody happy around her, you know, on the whole. So I think that is something to bear in mind, that we need to do it also through our own well-being, despite all these.